Anyway, in my first video, I made the case that uh, David E. Stannard, author of American Holocaust, The Conquest of the New World, is hell-bent on proving that we're just kind of incorrigibly bad, and that we're all kind of, uh, you know, guilty by virtue of association. You remember this quote here? We are the slaughterers. It is the tortured soul of our world. Well, again, it's William Carlos Williams is a, a poet, as I got into the last time. Uh, and his his uh, words often don't make any sense. This is, of course, part and parcel of why a lot of people write poetry, because they don't really have anything to say. What they want to state is basically a cliche. If they say it in bald prose, they look like idiots and be revealed as morons. So instead, they hide it under, under this kind of blank verse. It is the tortured soul of our world, you know, whatever the hell that means. But more importantly is that we are the slaughterers. We? Excuse me, pardonnez-moi, what did I do? I, what do I have to do? This is guilt by association, something which is very popular, for example, in non-democratic societies. And notice this is a kind of like a group think. In other words, it's um, we're being classed as a group. We're the slaughterers. We did it. So this, this is an element of otherism, which is, again, the kind of thing which you associate with Marxists and uh, communists, that kind of thing. Because they always like to put people into groups. It's like, you know, we are the good people, the the white hats, and the other people are the evildoers, the uh, black hats kind of a thing. And uh, this is indicative of a very kind of simple-minded way of thinking. Um, what it really shows is that people are just incapable of understanding systems. Uh, to understand systems, you have to understand, you know, math, uh, feedback loops, uh, you know, paradigms, how things work. Um, you have to be cause and effect and all the rest of it, which is which can be very complicated for simple-minded people who prefer to have a very moral view of the world. In other words, if you agree with me, you're a good person. If you disagree with me, you're evil, kind of a thing. And that's pre pretty much what he's getting at here, if you ask me. And it's uh, it's a very dangerous way of looking at things. Not to mention, it's just indicative of a very simple mind. So again, the fact that. Uh, Standard would would quote William Carlos Williams in, in this particular uh, you know, section of his uh, I don't know what you call this uh, prose or blank verse whatever is indicative of a lot indicative of a lot that's wrong with his thinking. Uh, here's another example here. Check out how Standard tries to uh, weasel word his way around uh, migration. In other words, that uh, he, want, he basically wants to make the argument. He wants to be able to say that the um, Amerindians were always in North America and South America and Central America. Now, of course, you can't actually make that argument, but obviously they weren't there. But look at how, what he tries to do as a weaseling way of making it appear that they really were there, after all. Okay, reading from Standard at the bottom. It conventionally is said that the migration or migrations to North America from Asia took place over the land bridge that once connected the two continents across what are now the Bering and Chutki Seas. Land bridge is a whopping misnomer, huh? However, unless one imagines a bridge immensely wider than it was long, more than a thousand miles wide, in fact, about the distance between New York and Omaha, compared with the lengthwise span across the Bering Strait today of less than 60 miles. So think about that. What he's doing is he's redefining what a bridge is. In other words, a bridge must, a bridge must be longer than it is wide. Why would that be? Well, that's because obviously we do that for to, to save on the, on the cost of building materials and whatnot. Okay? But a bridge is a bridge, right? It doesn't matter how wide it is. Or, well, it doesn't matter how long it is. If it connects A to B, where formerly there was no connection, it's a bridge. Correct? But you see how he tries to weasel out of it? Right? And here's why. Again, reading from Standard. To say that the first people of the Americas migrated, scare quotes, to North America from Asia is thus as much a misconception as is the image of the Beringian subcontinent as a bridge. Huh? For although the origins of the earliest Americans can indeed ultimately be traced back to Asia, just as Asian and European origins ultimately can be traced back to Africa, the now submerged land that we refer to as Beringia was the homeland of innumerable communities of these people for thousands upon thousands of years. In other words, what he's saying is um, something tantamount to this. Um, I was born in Scotland. Scotland is connected by land. Europe, Central Asia, Asia, to China. So what you could say is, for example, I was born in Scotland and I've, say, migrated to uh, China. But you would say, no, I didn't migrate to China because Scotland and China are connected. So actually, when I was in Scotland, I was really always in China the whole time because there's no bridge. They're connected. They're the same place. Now, of course, that's insane. But that's basically what he's saying. He's saying because they, because there wasn't at the time there was no ocean between separating North America from uh, East Asia, then actually they didn't migrate. They didn't really cross a border. It's just totally Weasley.
You know what I'm saying? Again, it's the same thing as if as if I was a Chinese person was to say, well, they actually always lived in Scotland, and that they have a claim to living in Scotland because China is, you know, connected directly to Scotland. It makes no sense whatsoever. But this is the kind of scummy tactic he's engaging in here. It's really ridiculous. Now you might think, okay, that's pretty crazy, but it couldn't get even crazier, could it? Oh, but yeah, sure, it can. Check this out. In his sweeping and iconoclastic study of modern Africa, for instance, Ali A. Masri makes the cogent point that ethnocentrism has shaped Western perceptions of geography, that the very maps of the world found in our homes and offices and classrooms, based on the famous Mercator projection, here it comes, dramatically misrepresent the true size of Africa by artificially deflating its land area. In other words, Mercator did this on purpose. Check this out. And that of all equatorial regions of the world, in comparison with the land areas of Europe and North America. In other words, what Mercator did is he tried to take a globe and, per and portray it on a flat space. And so the areas on the, on the, around the equator tend to be the same size. But as you stretch out there above the poles, right, everything becomes larger. You know this from uh, looking at basic maps, right? You know, uh, the Arctic area, the Arctic Circle, that area, the part of Canada and uh, and Alaska and the United States will look enormous compared to the uh, Canada as you go down, then it gets shrinks and gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you go down towards Mexico and down towards the, the equator, right? Check out, dude, what he, what he thinks is really going on here. Because the Mercator map exaggerates the distance between the lines of latitude for those regions that lie closest to the poles, North America is made to appear one and a half times the size of Africa, when in fact Africa contains in excess of two million more square miles of land. Well, that's true. Africa's huge. No question about it. A proportional cartographic distortion also affects the comparative depictions of Africa and Europe. Thus, the literal picture, scare quotes, of Africa in relation to the rest of the world that school children have been taught for centuries is in fact an outright fraud. In other words, what he's doing is he's pausing. He's saying the Mercator projection was developed as a way to, or well, either it was developed to, to, to defraud you know, school children so that they wouldn't realize how big Africa was and that's how important it must be in the scheme of things, which doesn't really make any sense because Japan's really small, but it's really, really big and really important in the scheme of things. So how important you are really doesn't have, it's not about how physically large you are. Right, I mean, you know, you know, look, look, look at the, look at how important Israel is compared to the rest of the Middle East. Israel is tiny, but its its, it's importance is extremely outsized. So, the, how how big you are on a Mercator projection map really doesn't make any difference, does it? It's ridiculous. Or what he's saying is that the Mercator projection is used by school teachers, by pale faces, as a racist scam to fool school children to think that Africa is small, and if it's small, we need to pay attention to that. I mean, have you ever heard anything that's so absurd in your, in your life? What about New York? New York City is tiny compared to the rest of the United States. I mean, what? I mean, it, New York looks small. Should it be bigger on a map so that we would appreciate its importance? What an idiot. I mean, it's incredible, but this is what I mean. This guy will say anything to anybody to get his point across. Okay, he's a fanatic. Okay, so this is basically what standards uh, idea of, a, you know, of an ideologically, politically correct map of the United States would look like. New York is this big section here. Brooklyn is this monster outsized section here. Bronx is up here. Staten Island is this also the way oversized, right? And then you get the flyover country on down to California, Hollywood, etc. So basically, from his perception, anything, any map which looked any different than this or some kind of version, ideologically speaking, of this would be racist, right? And he's absolutely out of his mind. Okay, so you might think I'm kind of cherry picking the good uh, professors' uh, work for uh, you know flies in the ointment, as it were. But uh, actually, not. Um, I mean, in my experience, anyway. For example, if you want to judge a book, if you're in a bookstore, you just uh, flip open, you grab it, flip it open to the middle, and uh, look at a paragraph or two or three. And uh, if it's engaging, then it's a good book. And if it sucks, then it's pathetic. Because I, in my experience, whatever whatever's wrong with a book will be found throughout the entire book. Uh, and given the fact that it took me all of, you know, five minutes to discover these two incredible bloopers in the professor's work, I have to presume that the entire book is just infested with this kind of crap. So as a thought experiment, let's take a look at some of the other uh, writings of the uh, venerable author. Here we have, for example, him uh, cutting into Christopher Hitchens, uh, who was the kind of the H.L. Mencken of the uh, 1990s and the 2000s. Anyway, he writes, and in the person of Christopher Hitchens, writing in the nation. 
The political left then sounded his voice. To Hitchens, anyone who refused to join him in celebrating with great vim and gusto, the annihilation of the native peoples of the Americas was, in his words, self-hating, ridiculous, ignorant, and sinister. Okay, so what did Christopher Hitchens actually say? Um, it's, uh, this is the article that uh, Standard was referring to. And this is a section down here. I'm not going to do a Christopher Hitchens uh, imitation because I tried and I just can't get it right. Not even close. Anyway, uh, Hitch writes, The transformation of part of the northern part of this continent into America inaugurated a nearly boundless epoch of opportunity and innovation and thus deserves to be celebrated with great vim and gusto with or without the participation of those who wish they had never been born. In other words, he's not celebrating with uh, great vim and gusto the annihilation of the native peoples. Quite, quite the opposite. What he's saying is that it was, it's terrible that they died. But what came up afterwards was uh, democracy ruled by law, uh, human rights, uh, the, the vote, first, first to men under, uh, from 21 and up, eventually to women, and then finally to men and women, uh, 18 to 21 in the 1970s. He's saying that this, there was this, you know, plus there was the Industrial Revolution, there was all kinds of... Um, you know, medicines, and there was penicillin. Um, you know, there, there was screen doors. There were there were shoes which didn't cause corns. I mean, there was just a technological innovation after innovation after innovation. Um, you know, free press, newspapers. Uh, you know, you went from the horse and buggy to uh, automobiles, airplanes, motorized boats, ships, uh, the telegraph, the telephone, a computer, all this kind of stuff, which none of it would have happened if, if America had to, had remained, uh, you know, in the hands of, of, of the quote unquote native population. But again, it's not a celebration of the fact that of their demise, what would have been much better would have been a modus vivendi if everybody could have gotten along, um, as they did very, very early on. Um, and, uh, they could, this could have thing could have happened jointly, could have happened together. Um, everyone could have, could have profited from the technological innovations and the rule by law and all. I mean, you know, Cherokee Indians, for example, they adopted many of the uh, much much of the, of the Western values, which which were you know <clears throat> on tap on the East Coast, including even slavery. <laughs> they became black slave, or owners of black slaves too, but they lived in brick houses. They 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 did you know they did the whole nine yards. Um, so I mean, it's not like it could not have happened. Um, but it unfortunately did not. But again, what Hitchens is saying is that uh, what came out of it, despite the, the bad beginning, was something which was very good. Another example is China, where you take a look at the situation in Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong is, uh, has much, even if it's not democratic per se, but it has rule of law, it has free, uh, free speech, and then free press, and all the rest. So compare that to, to China. Now, the reason you, Hong Kong is this way is because of the, uh, the, the Opium War. Um, and and the, at the end of the Opium War, the British tried to give Hong Kong back, but the terms of the deal were uh, rejected by the Emperor. The, the British said, okay, we need to exchange uh, ambassadors. And the Emperor refused to participate in modern diplomacy, in the, the, the kind of modern paradigm. As a consequence, the British said, well, look, if you cannot promise the security of our people, then we're going to have to retain an, an island so that we can house our diplomatic personnel uh, with, you know, with, in, a, in a safe uh, location. As a consequence of, of that, though, uh, Hong Kong just ended up, you know, being uh, imprinted with all kinds of uh, British, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, ideals. For example, very soon after the the British took over Hong Kong, they opened up the um, the judiciary to the Chinese. Another one of what they said is, if you can pass the, the English bar exam, you you can qualify to become a barrister and eventually even a judge if you qualify for that as well. And that was opened up immediately. Um, it took another generation for Chinese, the local Chinese population, to to have kids who could speak fluent English and who could therefore take study law, British law, and then take the bar exam and then qualify for barristers. But that's exactly that's what happened. Um, and so, as a consequence, uh, you know, Hong Kong, even though it was seized by the British originally, it actually benefited in many in many ways because of the uh, because of the um, its seizure. In other words, because uh, of the war um, during the Opium War, of course, a lot of people did die, but Hong Kong, in the end, became a much better place as a consequence. This is not a celebration of war. It's not a celebration of the fact that people died. Not at all. Um, but it's just saying that in the aftermath of the war, you had a much better situation, sh uh, sh you know, show up in, in uh, Hong Kong, which is why all these Chinese, this huge Chinese population just migrated over almost immediately and stayed. And, and, and you know, people were sneaking into Hong Kong right down to 1997 when it was taken over by the uh, by mainland China. And right now you can see in Hong Kong, you have all these protests where people are, are distinguishing themselves from the Chinese, so to speak, and, and you know, label them with all sorts of epithets um, because they don't want any part of, of, of uh, mainland China because, of course, uh, they benefited under British rule and subsequently under their own rule, which you know, has been, it's been uh, Hong Kong has been run by the Hong Kong people basically since 1997. 
with a certain amount of interference by the mainland government, of course. And the final point that Hitchens is making, too, is the fact that um, if you're, let's say you're, you're writing a book about Hong Kong history, are you going to spend all of your time whining about all the people who died uh, during various uh, slaughters? I mean, there have been slaughters in Hong Kong since, you know, um, I mean, it used to be full of pirates. I mean, how many times were people ambushed and killed off the, the coast of uh, Hong Kong Island or wherever? Um, and how many times were you know were there were there were there fights between the, you know different peoples, so the Tonka and the Cantonese and the Taozhou people and whatever else in that area? I mean, I'm sure people have been you know killing each other, you know, for thousands of years. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just the way the way things are. The, the old ways. I mean, one of the reasons why China has, has so many martial arts styles is because it was an incredibly dangerous people where people got killed on a regular basis. And if you didn't know how to protect yourself, you know, you were doomed. Back to Standard. He, he next writes uh, some more kind of, uh, what do you call it, non sequitur nonsense. One possible exception Hitler, Hitchens allowed to his vulgar social Darwinism with his quasi Hitlerian, Hitlerian view of the proper role of power in history was the Euro-American enslavement of tens of millions of Africans. But even then, Hitchens contended, those centuries of massive brutality only probably left Africa worse off than they found it. So what did Hitchens actually write? It's up here. As Marx wrote about India, the impact of a more developed society upon a culture can spread aspects of modernity and enlightenment that outlive and transcend the conqueror. This isn't always true, though. The British probably left Africa worse off than they found it. In other words, what he's saying is that the British went into Africa, they saw they conquered, and um, they left too fast. So rather than a place like Hong Kong, where you have civil liberties and rule of law, uh, in Africa you didn't have these things instilled into the local people because they hadn't stayed long enough and hadn't, the, the school system had not been erected uh, sufficiently long. Uh, with the consequence that, that uh, when the British left in the 1950s and 60s, Africa went to something which was called one man, one uh, vote, one time, uh, because the, the public wasn't, wasn't educated well enough about um, politics and they were, they were insufficiently cynical about promises being made. They ended up vo voting in criminals every, almost every time with the consequence that you have uh, Zimbabwe, a dictator, uh, uh, what's his name, Idi Amin in Uganda, a dictator, well, like before him there was Obote, Obote, Milton Obote, but anyway. Basically, you just had Africa just went down the tubes, um, and which is to say that Africa was, in fact, uh, worse off than when it, when, when it was found, as opposed to a place like Hong Kong, which was better off. That's what Hitchens is referring to. And then there's just Standard just kind of generally losing his mind. Uh, this, this section down here, I mean, check this out. This doesn't make any sense at all. These are, of course, precisely the same sort of retrospective justifications for genocide that would have been offered by the descendants of Nazi stormtroopers and SS doctors had the Third Reich ultimately had its way. That is, however, distasteful the means. The extermination of the Jews was thoroughly warranted given the beneficial ends that were accomplished. And imagine what would have happened had the war been fought with the assistance of the Jewish population in Germany. If there had been no... Um, objection to quote-unquote Jewish science, then the uh, the atom bomb would have been added to the list of uh, advanced weaponry that the Germans came up with first. And whoever was in charge of Germany, whether it was Hitler or some other, somebody else, and they, if they decided to wage a world war for whatever reasons, um, you know, because they wanted to go, they wanted to take take out the uh, the, the Russian communists first, and they, they, they got a t taste for you know, blood in their mouth, they decided to go uh, you know, West as well, and take out the UK for whatever reason. If this had happened, Germany would have won, you know, hands down easily. Had they had, uh, like I say, the, um, the 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 benefit of quote unquote Jewish science. So the idea that you know you can say that the that the sorry the Nazis would have if they'd won the war, you know, that they would have there this would have validated the extermination of the Jews is just ridiculous because there was no way for them to win the war because the only people, the only country which actually did uh, invent the atom bomb during the war was America, America which which hosted Albert Einstein who was key in getting the program off the ground because he wrote, he wrote a letter, a famous letter to uh, FDR. Um, you know, so again, this is just, this just, this is just, uh, this kind of factual is just ridiculous if you ask me. And what it also indicates is just the, the extent of the bias which Standard holds. He, he, he's just kind of oblivious to facts. He's just so hell-bent on proving what he thinks is, is right that he'll, he'll just manufacture any kind of... Uh, crazy argument and, and, and again this this goes to a couple of other things one is the fact that he has this moral outlook and that if you if you object to what he believes and then you just you're you know you're you're evil you're not wrong you're evil you're devilish um and he also go, brings back brings me back to the whole thing where he he quotes two poets 
as uh, people who inf influenced him and inspired him at the beginning. He wants to express his gratitude to them, you know. And I'm like, why would you go to poets for that? If you're if you're a writer in prose, uh, be, <laughs> again, it's to, to to me it suggests the fact that he's just highly emotional, that he cares that he cares less about content and more about appearances, and which is why he fumbles this argument because he cares more about the appearance of the as opposed to the facts of the matter. If he actually was if he was a person who was interested in systems and understanding how things worked, you know, cause and effect and feedback loops and uh, extrapolating out if such and such happened, then what would happen next? Blah 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 blah. If he was if he was engrossed by that process instead of being engrossed by the whole moral th uh, process, which is you know who's the who are the good guys and who are the bad guys and who can I tell me who I can hate because I want to hate somebody that's that's his basically his his outlook. If he wasn't possessed with this juvenile, um, you know, <laughs> point of view, I mean, he would have written a much better book. Okay, so again, let's get into uh, uh, kind of an elaboration of what Hitchens is really on about here. Uh, he writes, not long ago, another good man, Ted Solitaroff, sent me a book he had helped edit called Black Hills, White Justice by the author Edward Lazarus. This details the long courtroom battle fought by various factions of the Sioux, the Sioux uh, Indians, to reclaim their rights in the mountains of South Dakota. You can guess the story. Treaties were broken. Lands were filched. Settlements were put to the torch. Women and children were vilely abused. And all of it was done by the Sioux to the Kiowa Indians. <laughs> of course, who had controlled the Black Hills before the Sioux got there in 1814. Actually, the book deals mainly with the greed and depredation of the Pale Faces, which is no doubt as it should be. But it is honest enough to say that the Sioux did drive off the Kiowa, right? And it quotes Chief Blackhawk saying candidly, these lands once belonged to the Kiowas and the Crows, but we whipped these nations out of them. And in this, we did what the white men do when they want the lands of the Indians. You know, I mean, it's like if you think about the Aztecs, for example, the Aztecs came down from Salt Lake City and they displaced the Mayans. And the Mayans probably displaced the Olmecs and so on and so forth. I mean, you've had people in the, in the Americas. Well, originally people presumed that the, uh, the first quote unquote Native Americans came over and let's say just after the Ice Age. But nowadays, this date's been pushed back to like 130,000 years. Uh, it looks like there's been everything from uh, Melanesians, that's uh, black Pacific Islanders who made it over maybe, or, or maybe they made it over from the other direction. Um, Polynesians, I mean, there's all kinds, there's evidence of all kinds of things, of all kinds of people being in all kinds of places. I mean, like in Central Asia, if, you know, if you, the, uh, there's a bunch of mummies in um, uh, is it Xinjiang, maybe, from about 2,500 years ago, and they're all blondes and redheads. I mean, everybody was living all over the place and was uprooted and, and killed and murdered and raped and, and, and genocided by everybody else. I mean, this is just the, the course of uh, human history as it is. And of course, it's the same thing in the natural world. Um, one of the examples I give for that, for example, is uh, my my garden. I mean, my plants, if I don't trim them back, they, they do nothing but try to kill off each other. That's all they do every day is grow and try to strangle each other off. They, they issue poisons through the roots, through the leaves, and uh, they also leave, use leaf cover to try to steal all the, all the sunlight and just, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> just basically strangle off uh, every other plant in my garden. I mean, the plants are just constantly trying to kill each other off and genocide them, you know, each other. That's what they do. That's, that's just, you know, the, the law of uh, nature, so to speak. Which brings us to another error, I think, which Standard makes, which, uh, like a lot of people, he believes that uh, rights exist outside of uh, national boundaries or whatever, um, when in fact that's not the case whatsoever. Um, in order to have rights, you have to have an agreement, you have to have an adjudicating body, you have to have uh, a constabulary body as well, in other, in other words, to enforce the adjudication which comes down from the judges. If you don't have that, you don't have rights. Um, and so, if, for example, when you have relations between countries, there's no such thing as rights unless these rights are agreed upon by the countries themselves. You have, for example, something like the Geneva Conventions where countries do agree to certain things, or in the First World War where they agreed not to use poison gas, I think, after a while, or maybe it was the Second World War, I'm sorry, uh, where they, after the end of the First World War they, they agreed not to use poison gas again. But absent these agreements, there are such thing as rights. And so the idea that the Native Americans, for example, their rights were violated um, it's, it's just not correct because there was no thing as rights. Just, and it was the same with the European countries as well. It was, you know, if Germany and France went to war, or England and, and uh, Holland or whatever, or, or Spain went to war, there was no such thing as rights unless they, so these things were agreed to beforehand. And so you cannot expect people to be treated in, in the same humane fashion outside of national borders as you would expect them to be treated within the national borders. In other words, his sense of outrage uh, is just completely misplaced.
Um, it's just a fact of the matter that I mean, the, the law of, the, of, of nature basically applies. And you know, like like in my garden, for example, where my plants, my you know, they spend all their time trying to kill each other. The vines strangle off everything else. Uh, the, the 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 woody the woody plants they grow they grow taller. So they they use their leaves to uh, to shut off the, uh, the to catch the sunlight, which then doesn't reach the the bottom layer of the vegetation, which then which, where they they start to die off. Um, plants also poison each other. They release uh, you know fluids from their from their, from their roots, uh, spray form from their leaves. I mean, plants. My plants are constantly just trying to kill each other off. And if I didn't prune them back, I would have just essentially a monoculture where one plant would would dominate everything else and just kill off pretty much everything else. And that's just the way things are. And so, if you understand the system, then you can appreciate how things happen, and you get out of this kind of moral outrage mindset. You, you realize, okay, if I'm going to exist in such a situation, what do I need to do? How do I need to be prepared? In terms of mindset, in terms of expectations, in terms of what should I prepare, what should I get ready to protect, to protect myself, and which is where he comes into things like you know, Second Amendment, gun rights, and things of that nature. Which is why people like myself tend to be pro for these things because we don't we don't think we can always rely on the government to protect you, or all, all of the government to protect you. The parts of the government can come after you. Uh, I mean, for example, you, you, just just having weapons. I mean just showing up in public uh, to protest a, a decision by a judge, whatever else, and you have a standoff, no shots need to be fired, but you can still really get people's attention, including the media, and you can get things done. That's a non-violent use of weapons in public to force governments to, ch to change. I mean, these, these things, that I, could, I should give an example of that, I guess. All right, well, here you go. There's the Bundy standoff, you may remember it, 2016. Uh, an armed confrontation between supporters of cattle rancher Clive and Bundy and law enforcement following a 21-year legal dispute in which the United States Bureau of Land Management obtained court orders directing Bundy to pay over $1 million in withheld grazing fees. He was on federally owned land. Uh, his family and their supporters claim the federal government lacks the authority to manage public lands. I have no opinion on this whatsoever, but who knows? Maybe there's something to it. Maybe not. I have no idea. Uh, this dispute started in 1993 uh, in protest against changes in grazing rules. Um, Anyway, they showed up with, uh, friends showed up with weapons to, uh, here we go, on April 12th, 2014, a group of protesters, some of them armed, approached uh, the sheriff, etc., etc. They definitely forced some kind of a showdown. Otherwise, they could have, they would have uh, simply shut down Bundy and it would have been all over. Instead, they showed up with weapons. Okay, they got the attention of the media. No shots were fired. Nobody got hurt. Um, and um, on January 8, 2018, U.S. District Judge Gloria Navarro in Las Vegas dismissed with prejudice the criminal charges against Clive and Bundy, his sons Eamon and Ryan. <laughs> so there you go. So the idea that, that if you have, uh, what are you going to use your weapons for? You can't take on the government, man. Um, it's true in a bundle of ways. This is just the most obvious. Anyway, as usual, this video, uh, like most of my others, has gone way over the, the time limit that I had imposed upon myself. This was supposed to be about a 10-minute video tops, but oops. Anyway, I hope I made my point, which is that uh, Standard is simply not to be trusted, and he's motivated by a very childish kind of uh, desire to be right about everything, and he doesn't give a damn about the facts. Uh, he'll make any argument to anybody. He'll say anything to anybody because he's a fanatic. And he, in his own mind, he's a hero, and he's right, and everyone else who disagrees with them is wrong. They're not worse than wrong. They're evil. And uh, so he doesn't give other people their, their due. He doesn't take other people's arguments seriously. It's not even that he's trying to, that he's some sort of crook, and he's trying to, you know, like a politician, he's trying to manipulate other people's arguments. He's just such an idiot. He's an idiot in the sense that he cannot think clearly. That's sort of an idiot. I don't mean he's low IQ or anything like that. I'm just saying that he's, well, he is low IQ because he can't deal with systems. And that's why he just, has it makes these insane accusations but again i'm sure it, it works for him in his in his circles he likes poets who, people who care about uh, appearances not reality and he similarly cares, cares about appearances not reality and if things appear to be brutal and evil then they must be brutal and evil and forget about the system underlying it again uh there, there's no the, the indians didn't have rights um there was there were, they weren't there, there was no moral i mean <laughs> i mean I'll, this video will go on forever if i start talking about morals i'll just leave it at this uh, he's not to be trusted, and uh, which is unfortunate because um, when he when he lists all these kind of this nastiness which took place at the hands of Europeans, I agree with him. It was nasty, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of nastiness in Europe itself. Oh, I agree totally, but I just totally disagree with the fact, with the claim that there was no nastiness going on in in the Americas with the Native Americans because, of course, they tortured, they cannibalized, they they fought and killed, um, they harvested people, they sacrificed people. And they did all kinds of things because they're human beings, and human beings do these kinds of things. Human beings do these things everywhere. Europeans have done them. North Americans have done them. Everyone's done them. 
Um, that's just the way things are. But if you, if you write a story like that, then you can't poise it in a, in a moral way in which, you know, you, the people you support are the guys in white, white hats, the other people are bad hats. If he was more intelligent, what he would do is he'd write a book, like, like, like an anthropological survey of people. And he would show you how these systems evolve. Uh, Marvin Harris did this marvelously in his Cannibals and Kings and the other books which he did. Bestsellers, extremely, extremely good. The standard is an idiot compared to Marvin Harris, who apparently, I guess, in anthropological circles, is a genius. Um, and it shows. And, this, and the problem was, Stan, because he's a moron, compared to uh, Harris, he has to do a moron's book, which is basically lies of omission all the time, and accusing all of your detractors of, of being um, evil dudes, and, you know, sort of soulless, and what do you call it? Quasi Hitlerian, all the rest of it. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, I'll wrap it up right here. If you like what you what you saw, please hit the subscribe button. And uh, anyway, I'll see you at the next video. Hopefully, it'll be shorter than this one. Cheers. Bye bye.